Welcome back to Scuba Diver Live. Uh, the team's here again to bring you another hour of uh, some fun and interest around the diving world. Keep us all occupied while some of us are still in complete lockdown and others are just starting to get the fins wet again after a few months of a forced hiatus. Um, just remember, if you like what we're doing, hit the subscribe button, hit that little bell. You'll never miss any of the future installments that we've got coming up because uh, we've got a lot of good things coming up over the next few weeks. So remember that. Um, please do leave your comments. We like to see what you um, think we're doing. Um, anything you want to see as topics in the future, let us know. Uh, we'll do the best we can to oblige. Um, and remember, if you're watching us live, fire us through any questions that you've got for our guests, and we'll be putting them to them at the end of the session. Um, before we bring our guests on, just like to say thank you to our sponsors, Meflex Hoses. Um, these tough, durable hoses are great. If you want to add a bit of colour to your kit, stand out from the crowd, check out their shop. They're online now and doing deliveries even during lockdown. Um, right, on with today's show. Um, basically, we're looking at how to make a living out of diving, which, end of the day, that's what we'd all like to do. Um, so you've got two main routes. You can go pro to train uh, recreational and technical divers, or you can go the other route and become a commercial diver. So we thought, right, we'll look at both of those. So on the virtual sofa today, we've got two experts from these fields. We've got Warren Sal Salis for the commercial diving side of things, and Tech Clark all the way from Florida, who's doing the going pro side. So welcome, guys. Hey. Hello. Hi, oh, right, yeah. thanks for joining us this afternoon. Um, thanks very much. Yeah, it's great to so, be here. Uh, we are a bit jealous of you at the moment, Tech, um, because we understand that you're actually going diving this afternoon, whereas we're all still kind of a little bit stuck at home. I am. It was uh, it was kind of sad as we were backstage talking about uh, how beautiful it is right outside here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and how easy it is to get to our reefs. And yeah, I'll, I'll be out uh, in the ocean in a couple hours and uh, doing some cool dives. So yeah. Yeah, sorry, to rub it all in. <laughs> here, here in the UK, we have got some people just starting to uh, to get out for their first uh, post coronavirus shore dives. Yeah, um, we can't feel too. I can. I'm more jealous than Sal because Sal's very lucky because he does actually live right on the uh, the water's edge down in Cornwall, so he's almost as lucky as you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll all be back in the water soon, hopefully, though. So that's the main thing. That's right. So right, let's get started. So the base. Best thing is really, we always like to find out where everyone started. So it's really, how did you first get started <coughs> in diving itself? Oh, well, um, for me, it was right off the shores here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Um, when I was a kid, 12 years old, I went right off the beach and that was it. Loved it, got hooked, did my uh, certifications, and then ultimately went to college when I went to University of Florida. That's where I became an assistant instructor and then an instructor. And the best part was, was that I, I borrowed the money from my mom the night before the instructor course started. And I said, Mom, I need I need a thousand dollars to go through. It's back in the day. It wasn't very expensive. 1988. And uh, she said, well, it's something you can always fall back on. And that was like this famous line that she and I just <laughs> laughed about to this day because what I was going to fall back on became my career. <laughs> that's a good fallback. I like that. Yeah. Fallback, default position, and that's actually become your career. So that's a good one. No one you get a laugh out of that. What about you, Sal? Have you got a similar sort of route? What did you do? Uh, I was in my early 20s, and uh, I was serving in the Marines at the time. And uh, it looks like a pretty cool job. So during my summer leave, I went and did a paddy open water in Dost Hill Quarry. I'm sure many people know where that is. And uh, got my recreational qualifications. But, so I didn't look stupid on the military course. Uh, and it just kind of grew from there, really. And as I did the military diving, uh, I carried on with the recreational uh, tickets and also gained my commercial qualifications as well while I was still serving. Oh, so you managed to do all that down in the background of actually still being serving military and you were doing that at the same time. You like to keep yourself busy. Well, I kind of figured if I was uh, my sergeant major at the time, kind of liked the idea that I could take the lads off diving. So uh, if we were organising trips to go somewhere nice, we weren't getting shot at. So that's a pretty good idea. <laughs> I like it. That's definitely, that's definitely positive. Yeah, I like that thinking. That's good. Um, tech, back to you. Um, as you're saying, it actually became your career. 
Um, and when I first met you, you were one of the uh, the key members of probably one of the most successful instructor training centres on the planet at the time. Um, and I know you've got instructor ratings with many agencies and everything. So regardless of training agency, <coughs> what are qualities that some people should maybe look at when they're researching locations that offer instructor training? Yeah, so if somebody wants to go through the route to be a pro, um, obviously, you know, if you're listening to this show, you know that there's a path for certifications to, to go through. Um, and once we get past rescue diver, we start to embark in the leadership roles. And the leadership is dive master, assistant instructor, instructor, instructor trainer, and so forth. Um, so when one is picking that that route to go and they are uh, you know going into the dive master, you you really want to take a look at a few things. When we talk about like the uh, you know early certifications that the agency really doesn't matter. Um, but once you start coming up into the leadership areas, the agency actually does take a little bit more of a matter. And part of the reason is, is that you may have to go somewhere to get your training. You may take it locally. It really is kind of a, a, a variety of what you want and what you can afford and what you can get out of it. So it doesn't matter if it is your, um, your, your local dive center that you've done your training with and they also offer instructor or if you're looking to go halfway around the world to go to a resort that does instructor and instructor internships where you stay there, the things that you really want to focus on is the type of training that you're going to come out with. And um, it's just not about the certification. It's not about the instructor level certification. It is what are you getting while you're there. And so in that time period, you could do it in a very condensed time frame, or you could lengthen it out. I'm a little bit more on the uh, bias of a longer program. It, it tends to work a little bit better for schedules. It tends to work better for learning. And if one can extend that out and go through and then pause, you'd be surprised how many instructors have never been a dive master on a boat. They got the certification dive master, but they went straight into instructor and never worked a day on a boat. I love recommending if it's possible, work as a dive master first, get some experience under your belt, pause that training, and then move into instructor. You'll be a better instructor for it. And so by looking at what you're getting along the way, what you'll come out with, what is all of the bells and whistles that can happen during it. You might get specialty training along the way too. These are some of the things to take a look at. And my biggest, biggest tip for that is you got to engage with who your instructor trainer or trainers will be. They're also known as course directors in some agencies and so forth. You really want to engage with them. Don't show up if you haven't met them, done something like a Zoom chat or a Skype with them so that you can see them, their personality, what they believe in. Let them talk you through because you'll be able to catch very quickly if they're just what we call an instructor mill where they churn them and burn them and put them out and it's just quick and everything's just fly and that's it. Or are they going to take time? with you. And here's the different stages that you go through. And then I would also say, you're doing this because you want to be a pro. Well, what do you want to do with the pro level? If you're at your local dive center, then that might be the place that you actually wind up teaching. So you go with them, you go with their, their training agency and so forth. But if you go to a school and you actually go somewhere, you do want to see if they have placement programs. And so the placement programs are a really good thing to look at too when you're considering that. They can't guarantee that you'll get a job. Um, some places guarantee that you'll get an offer. <laughs> you might not want the offer, but they can't guarantee you'll get a job. But if they can help you, that means they have a reputation that they're producing good instructors that come out of their program and that other places throughout the world are saying, hey, we'd like to get your instructors. Good advice.
Good advice. Now, Sal, you ran a recreational diving centre as well as your commercial side of things at, for several years at the same time before you purely concentrated on the commercial side. What were the biggest differences between the two operations? Main things is um, one was tempo. So in the recreational side, people perceive the value for money uh, because they're getting the maximum time underwater, maximum time from you as the instructor or the dive master. They're getting to see everything they want to see uh, on the dive site and the marine life and everything else. When you go over to the commercial side, all people want you to do is just get in and get the job done as quick as you can. So totally other ends of the spectrum there. Um, and because of that, you, you kind of, when you get in, you just, you're so focused on the job you don't actually notice your surroundings around you. So people always say, oh, what's the visibility like when you're working? If it's recreational, you want it to be as far as you can. When it's commercial, as long as you can see about a foot in front of you or close up by the visor, then you can see to do your job. And sometimes you're even doing it with your eyes closed, just feeling your way with the spanners and stuff. Uh, so very different there. The other thing is, uh, what we found is we would work uh, overseas, say in the winter months, a uh, place like Kenya, Panama, things like that. Uh, and then we'd come home uh, and do things in the UK in the summer months, whereas the commercial side is all year round. And if anything, there's different forms of the commercial diving that's busy all year round or in, in the winter months and the summer months. So in your winter months, you're doing loads of harbour work, maintenance, uh, lots of shipping work. And in the summer, there's more marine civils, construction jobs that are weather dependent because other assets are sort of on site. So it's vastly different uh, from that point of view. Did you have much of a crossover with people that you maybe started with you diving on the recreational side and, you know, went so long with you, been diving with you and everything and then decided to take the jump into commercial diving and do the commercial uh, training with you? Yeah, I mean... When we had, um, so first of all, when I left the, the forces, uh, my wife Tamsa and I, we went overseas because we wanted to live the dream as, as Tech's been talking about. You know, if you can do this job anyway, you might as well do it somewhere nice, you know. Um, so we did that for a number of years. Uh, and then we thought, well, you know, we'd like to be home for a bit in our own beds. Uh, and then we set up the center together. Um, and as that progressed, though, what was always in the background was the commercial diving. Uh, and then when we actually got to the point where it was it was quite a lot of time and um, in certain fields, it was like uh, unsociable hours because the time you want to take people or people want to go diving is a weekend. Uh, and Tams and I decided to start a family. So weekends were quite precious. So the commercial then kind of took over uh, and then we kind of made the decision to stop the recreational side because you can't do everything. Uh, and carried on with the commercial and from that we had a couple of in the early days people who had uh, come through our system on the recreational and decided actually that that sounds really good I'd like to do that only a couple because you know you, you kind of your worlds only coincide don't they for a short period of time uh, and then as the commercial side of things uh, progressed um, we, we then opened the school and the reason why I opened the school uh, the commercial school uh, was because I was having a good old whinge one day to my um, my business partner, George, uh, about the divers we had. I was paying them a day's wage. Then I was teaching them in the evening how to do the job for the next day that I was going to pay them for. Uh, <laughs> so the skill set I felt was slightly lacking. Uh, and he said, well, why don't you just open a school, which I wasn't keen on at the start. Um, but it's actually been really good and it's it's come on big guns, you know. Uh, so we've got the commercial school and then we've got the contracts company. So people, if we take that to another stage, uh, people we've trained now, we employ in our contracts company. So it's nice to see their careers develop. Yeah, and also that fits in with, like um, Tech was saying, from the recreational side of things as well. If you've trained them to a standard and you know what they're capable of, then you've no hesitation with sending them off on a job because you know that they're capable of doing it. So it's win-win all round, really. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we always try to help 
uh, former students as much as we can. Uh, some don't need any help. They've either already got a job or they've already got an in with a company or geographically, it doesn't suit them to come and work for us. Um, but where possible, we'll always kind of uh, introduce new students to get that first entry in the logbook and the first job and that first bit of experience under their belt. So it's really nice to see. And then also, if we advance a little bit further, some of the guys who um, we've trained have then gone offshore, gone into saturation. And uh, George was offshore in the North Sea uh, last year. And he's actually on the uh, bell, same bell run uh, and in his team is one of the guys we trained like three or four years previous is now his uh, bellman on a sat trip. So that's really good to see. Yeah, that's nice. Kind of goes full circle, really, uh, which is cool. Um, right. Next question really kind of goes to both of you. Um, whether you're a recreational dive pro or a commercial diver, what qualities are the main things that you look for people if they're wanting to go into either of those routes? Um, <clears throat> do you mean to train them or to hire? If I was uh, on the hiring side of a brand new instructor, which which one would you? Yeah, I think more if the, it was somebody, yeah, if you were maybe running the training courses and stuff and people were wanting to get involved, there's obviously certain people that you maybe look at and you think, actually, you're more cut out to be an instructor yeah. than somebody else. Oh, yeah, perfect. Okay, great. Um, so I think that there are certain things that are great characteristics and uh, character attributes of an individual that is a very successful dive professional. And um, I mean, the dive professional world runs a gamut. Like I said, you could be a dive master all the way up. You could teach specialties. You could be a free diving instructor. You can do technical diving. But the qualities are that you really need to have uh, on your physical skill sets an absolute aquatic comfort. You need to be what I call and what I teach my, my dive leaders and upcoming leaders. You have to be a master of your domain, which means that um, when you are in the classroom, underwater, on a boat, whatever that is, you have to have mastery of that domain and be as comfortable as you can. So um, we still get people that will come through a, a dive master or an instructor course and they can barely uh, clear a mask or they have horrible neutral buoyancy skills. That really needs to be worked on before you get into the instructor course. At Dive Master and higher, we start to work on what's called demonstration quality. And so the demonstration quality of a skill is not, it's not good enough just to do a mass clear. It's breaking it down into the elements and attributes of the clear. So can you teach that effectively? Can you pause and show the water halfway there and show that you're okay? And now show your head going back. And so we break it down into demonstration quality. So a person has to physically have really uh, good composure and skill sets in the water and be just comfortable and love the water. It's their environment. The second thing is, is that you have to have the people skills to be an educator. So you all have gone through classes at some point, whether it's high school or college, university, and you've had instructors, professors that were absolutely horrible. And you've had ones that were absolutely great. We don't want the attributes of those horrible people. And so if you're into it to get these chevrons and wear a patch jacket and, you know, be a cool, like I'm an instructor and, you know, you've got your shark's tooth and you're wearing your Speedos, um, that is not the deal. And so I try to screen that real quick to see if a person is doing this for just stroking their ego and uh, and just being you know, that type of a, of a, of a person, or if they really, really care about teaching other people about the underwater world and showing them the underwater world. That to me is one of the biggest attributes I look for is, is this person humble and can they teach? Do they want to teach? And my final thing is, is that, um, when we get the instructor certification, it doesn't end there. As we say, that's your license to learn. Like you realize how much you actually don't know once you become an instructor. And all the instructors listening right now are going, yeah, yeah. 
because you, do, you you just there's so much more to learn and get experience with and that's a really cool thing so those would be some of the things that that i would say are some of the biggest makeup traits that i would look for for somebody that wants to be a dive <coughs> Sal, so it's slightly different with a commercial diver because they're obviously not training anyone. Um, but yeah, what sort of qualities do you look for people who are wanting to be a commercial diver? Is there anything that you look at them and you think, yeah, you cut out for it or be or not? Yeah, if I, if I take it kind of slightly similar from the side of the commercial school. So when they first start with us, we've got nine weeks to teach them all the skills they need to go straight out into industry. Um and do a job that somebody's paying them for and wants to do them to do the job to the best of their ability. So we get them together right at the start and you, you kind of feel it's like those cheesy movies where you're giving them the, the, the pep talk. But the thing is in nine weeks, you, you can't teach them life lessons, you know, or very few. Um, so when you've got somebody there in front of you, who's always on transmit and they're not willing to learn anything, you, you kind of, your work's cut out for you straight away. Uh, and it's very much the same as if I was an employer, which I am, uh, and looking to fill a dive team. Uh, I want the guy who's who listens, uh, can follow the instructions to the letter, not do his own thing because he thought it was a better idea on the seabed, you know, things like that. You know, the diver on the seabed is an extension of the supervisor who's running the job topside. So all he wants you to do is just do as you're told. Um, and we normally find that the guys with the, the bravado and, you know, and they're, they're quite good at talking about themselves. Um, they fall from a further height a lot quicker than the rest. Um, so, you know, we've had guys who tell you they can do everything, you know, and they're the best thing since sliced bread. Uh, actually, when it gets down to it, the small little guy who's quiet, you know, at the back of the team is the one who pulls it out of the bag, really. Um, and I look at, and the other divers look at it as well, that the person who's on that team with them, uh, could they, if it was all going wrong uh, and it was pitch black and the guy's trapped, would he get him out of trouble? And could he do everything he could instead of come up with an excuse of why, you know, cut and dry, but that's... The truth of it really we want somebody who's going to do the job does he's told you know and just knuckles down yeah yeah sound advice now again this is for both of you um probably more from the side as running a dive center or running a commercial operation and you're hiring people to make people more hireable what other skills do you think are the most useful for divers to add to their arsenal to make them more employable but that part of the word. So either coming in as a recreational technical instructor or coming in as a commercial diver, what other skills could they do outside of diving that you might look for and think that's a useful addition? Yeah, the, the main one that they can do quite easily and without a lot of specialist help is actually time on the water. We It always surprises me uh, that people turn up to do a job where they're going to be waterborne I've never spent any time on the water, on boats, around it, anything like that. Uh, to the point that we've actually introduced like an RYA powerboat level two on their on the main air diver course. So they just have an understanding of how to make a boat off, you know, catch lines, um, just general terminology, where to find things, you know, stuff like that. Um, so water time, time around boats. Uh, always handy if they've got uh, background qualifications where, or even experience where they can, about, you know, use of tools, general mechanical knowledge. Um, welding's always absolutely great, but you're not going to be hired as a welder straight away. You know, you're hired as a diver. Um, but the thing is, nobody sees you underwater. All right, they might see what you're doing with the hat cam but nobody sees you moving around underwater as a commercial diver. What they do see for 75% of the time is you on deck. And if all you're doing is chatting away or you're on your phone, you know, your first days are last uh, and it's pretty cutthroat like that. So yeah, you know, what we see on the top side, 
paints a picture for us. Good advice. Tech, what about from the uh, recreational instructor side of things? What, what makes people more employable? Yeah, so, you know, first thing is everybody really gets bought into the specialties. So that once you have more specialties under your belt, then that dive center can offer more courses and more more different uh, specialties and so forth. So that is a definite marketable thing. Uh, but it's not the only thing because there's so many people that have so many specialties um, that it, it doesn't become as competitive as people think. Actually, when you take that resume and you are saying, hey, I would love to work for your dive center, um, think about things. I would echo what Sal saying about the boat stuff. So a lot of resorts and dive centers have boats affiliated with them. So if you have any type of seamanship experience or even mechanical experience, that then becomes like a big one for people to look at that, ah, this person's going to be able to help us out and knows their way around the boat but the mechanical side as well. Then when you start to get into um, looking at dive centers, dive centers throughout the world are come in all different shapes and sizes, but many of them, our local dive centers, are kind of the mom and pop owned small business. And what winds up happening is there's a lot of struggle for small businesses to be good at all the things you need to be good at as a dive pro. And so if all of a sudden a dive business has all these areas within it, like, okay, we have to sell equipment, we have to train, we have to um, fix gear. So there's a whole repair center, there's a rental center, uh, renting gear. And, you know, it just goes on and on and on with all of these different areas. Well, if you come in and you say, hey, look, I know how to repair. I've got my credentials, my certifications for, for this. That becomes uh, a good thing. But even to the point of just marketing, you would be surprised at how many, should I say, older, older dive center owners there are that simply don't understand social media. And so if you come in and you are just like a social media whiz and you can explain this and this and this and this, and you can say, well, yeah, I do this all the time. I know how to do HTML. I can do code. I can work your websites. Those become skill sets that then you'll see dive centers all day long saying we need a better presence. We need this. So I would say it's those type of things that really are kind of the, the little, uh, and that's what I'm seeing is that th those dive centers will key on these other ancillary skills rather than a whole boatload of specialties. Yeah, sound. And it, and that's the thing is this, is, this is why I just thought this was interesting to look at is that sometimes I've, you know, when I've been talking to people over the last 20 odd years that I've worked in the industry, is people do get a bit caught up on, purely the dive skills, like you said, just getting the specialties and thinking that that will be enough to make them stand out from the crowd. But actually, there could be lots and lots of people that look much the same as them. So it is all the extra things. Languages as well is another bonus one that I would add in there because more and more places deal with, you know, people from all over the world. So if you've got four languages that you can add, like you said, mechanic skills, this, that, and the other. So yep. these are all things that people need to think about when they're wanting to uh, to go pro either route, really. Yep. Um so that brings me on to the next one is, is one or two things of hints or advice that are main things, just like little quick bite-sized chunks that you could give to anyone who's wanting to start out and come in a recreational instructor or going into commercial diving. I think, you know, be sure it's for you. Uh, don't be under the misconception that after your first days of diving, you're going to go with your first day's wages, go and buy a Rolex and a Porsche. It's not going to happen. You know, it's like anything you've got to build your way up through the system um and you're only as good as your last dive uh you know people remember the good guys and the good guys are always in work uh the ones who can't find work there's a reason you need to change your plan um so make sure it's absolutely 100 percent for you uh it's not all glamorous you know there's days when you're upside down pitch black, things are bumping into you, you don't know what it is, and you can't get out till you've done the task and your suit's leaking. 
you know, and when you do get out, it's freezing cold and you've got another eight hours on the job. So don't go into it under any misconception that it's just sunny in a T-shirt and you're just going to be the hero and save the day. Make sure it's what you want to do. Go and do your research. Go and speak to companies and say, if I've got my qualification, what's the chance of a job? You know, and make sure you've really asked the questions. And we at the school say, you know, you can phone up as many times when you make an inquiry. But when you do arrive, I want you to make sure that you've made the right decision. And then we can just get on with training you to do your future career. Yeah, good shout. Tech, what about you? Um, <clears throat> I would say that the the number one piece of advice that I would give an aspiring dive professional is, and even dive professionals that are already, is that you are making a significant investment into getting a professional rating. Um, what you must do, must do, is employ that you are supervising people. You are in the business of teaching people how to interpret the underwater world, but you're teaching them how to be safe. Even a dive master level, it's about supervision and a little training. We start coming up into the instructor ranks and now it's more about the teaching side and supervision and safety side. Never let those down. And what I mean by that is that what we tend to see is that an, a person wants to be an instructor and they're given these books and materials and standards and procedures and then they're tested on them and then they test out a few things and try teaching here and try teaching there. And then they come out and they've got that training. But what happens is, is that it becomes prescribed. The, the training system becomes prescribed and the instructor gets in these kind of routes of the training system and they don't think of expanding and it's all about just following a style or a, a sheet or a card my number one advice is do not do that you should absolutely broaden your skill sets broaden your education because the more experience and the more education that you have by reading countless books and going to places and everything, you get to bring that into your students' lives. So it means never stop learning and pour more into the students. Pouring yourself, your knowledge, your talents into the people that you are coming in contact with, it's one of the greatest blessings there is. And that's why so many of us love teaching. We love being dive professionals. And there's, you know, good days and bad days and hard stuff and you know that kind of stuff but at the same time you are pouring your energies talents academics everything into the people that you're teaching do not get get that into just a black and white pablum make it big go bigger learn more and then give that to people give it good like that like that right now we know that divers all divers are like kids with new toys um and i know recreation and technical divers in particular still like shiny new equipment and they're starting to have a rebreathers and everything but it definitely rings true with commercial divers and we can see from sal with his nice shiny range of uh, his helmets behind him there <laughs> definitely true. so what are some of the coolest bits of kit in the commercial diving world because there is some pretty awesome gear that you've told me about yeah, the best one has got to be one of the most basic ones, which is called Broco. Now, Broco is a thermic underwater lance. Even the name sounds cool. Uh, in effect, it's an underwater lightsaber. So you've got uh, a cable that's giving you anything up to about 250, 300 amps, 12 volt DC. Uh, so you can still get electrocuted with a bit of a belt, but it's not going to kill you. Um, and then coupled with that, we feed some oxygen down it as well in parallel into the gun that has a rod, a tubular rod that then has uh, mild steel and magnesium rods in and the O2 can feed down it. You then get uh, an earth clamp that's actually connected to the negative and you connect it to a piece of metal you get a cut. You make the circuit with the gun and then you have this fireball at the end of the tip of the rod 
that's burning at 4,000 degrees centigrade. So you can kill anything you want to kill down there. You know, obviously we don't. You know, um, but you'll cut through steel, wood, rubber, you know, fingers, anything. But it's really good for a quick underwater cut. Uh, and to see something burning underwater uh, is, is quite phenomenal. Yeah, I've had some good fun with that. Yeah, so you had me sold on underwater lightsaber. I think that's it. I can just imagine people lying <laughs> just be wanting to have a go and just have a session having a go with an underwater lightsaber because uh, no one's going to have Especially a, with the Darth Vader breathing in the background. Yeah, exactly. That's it. You've even got the breathing to go with it. I like it. Um, right, that brings me on to the fun questions now. These are the ones that everyone always likes to ask. What is your most memorable dive um, that you've ever had uh, anywhere in the world? Yeah. Uh, mine is pretty sappy. So, you know, <clears throat> get out your... Uh, hankies or you know, bring your wife or whatever i don't whatever you want to say but anyhow mine uh just happens to be the most memorable experience that i've had was with um turks and caicos aggressor and we were on a, a night dive and i'll never forget we went down it was my wife and i and it was her first night dive and we went down we were at 80 feet and we laid in the sand. There was a sand spot kind of in the middle of this reef. We laid down, we shut our lights off and we laid back and looked up. And what we saw were the, the stern lights that were down, pointing down into the water. And it was attracting all of the shrimp. Well, the shrimp at the surface were then getting with the bigger fish that were coming in and getting them. And then occasionally a shark would come through and do that, you know, just over. And so that's the silhouette that we saw. Our eyes got accustomed to being down. And I look over and right next to my wife is this beautiful octopus that's just next to her. And she saw that, loved it. And when I think of great dives, it's not only one of the best dives, it's also one of the best memories with my wife. We just sat there holding hands and looking up. We didn't want to come up. Um, it, it was just absolutely out of this world. It was just fantastic. So, boo-hoo. <laughs> that no, that's pretty cool. I can totally get that. I can totally get that. Uh, what about you, Sal? Um, I've just dried my eyes after that one tech. That was a <laughs> good one. Um, mine is pretty similar, if I'm going to be honest. I mean, you know, I love diving in uh, Gozo, where it's beautifully clear. I love some of the working dives I've done that are quite challenging, and you get out and you think, yeah, not many people could have done that. But, you know, the most memorable one is quite a recent one, um, and it's real simple. It was in about four or five metres of water, uh, and last year in Atlantic Bay, Tamsin and I, we um, taught our son, Harry, uh, how to dive and just nice being underwater uh, next to those guys and just thinking, yeah, pretty lucky. Yeah, proud dad moment. Very much. Very proud moment. <laughs> um, so that takes me on to the next one. Uh, with that, that is like a nice memorable experience. What is your favourite place? to go diving, whether it's in your own country or abroad? My favorite place uh, is Gozo, just off Malta. Uh, amazing visibility, you know, lovely topography underwater. Um, and it's just, yeah, when you're there, it's just so chilled out, really good place. Um, I would have to say um, my favorite has been Turks and Caicos, that it just, beautiful beautiful walls the walls are just amazing and uh flat seas calm great visibility abundant fish life turks and caicos would be my number one it's a good tick like that so that's the places you like to go what's your favorite type of marine life i I would have to say my favorite marine life is literally the juveniles um, of angels, uh, wrasses, gobies. 
I really, everybody talks about big, right? They love the whale sharks and the big stuff. I am the exact opposite. I love nothing more than to get close to a reef, hang out and just watch what's right in front of me. And to realize that life is just, you know, so tiny and you watch them do their stuff. That to me is awesome. It's awe inspiring. I feel so um, significant and insignificant at the same time. That just moves me. So I would say the real small stuff, small reef fish, juveniles, uh, the smaller, the better. Scallops. No. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Um, do you know, been lucky to see quite a lot of marine life, um, and even on some working dives, uh, not in the best kind of situations though, but they're very impressive. Um, every time I've had to fill up a hole with concrete, there's always been a big conger in the back. Uh, and just, yeah, they they mean business, those little fellas, don't they? Um, and then one time, uh, there was a dolphin down the, the, the South coast and he just kept on going into harbors and things. I was doing a, a commercial chain inspection and uh, I had a hat cam on and he came above at the top of the helmet. So all they saw on the top side was uh, this big eye, uh, which kind of freaked them out more than me. But then after a while, because I wouldn't play with him, he got a bit bored and decided to go off and grab my umbilical thinking I was trapped. And he dragged me off the job uh, with my umbilical in his mouth which we just had to get out in the end. But seeing them down there close up when you're trying to work is, is just phenomenal. Yeah, dolphins are lovely things, aren't they? Yeah, that's cool. Well, that's, that was actually quite amusing then, but that brings me on to a nice question then that everyone always has a bit of a chuckle about is, what is your funniest diving experience that you've ever had, or one of them? Okay, I'll, I'll try to keep this clean. So we were, uh, it was when I was learning my commercial training and we were being trained in Broco. And one of the things is you can get little electric shocks. So we were told if you've got any um, metal fillings or anything like that, make sure you're cutting with your mouth open so you don't fuse your fillings together. And one of the guys had uh, some piercings in his face and stuff. And uh, I just tried to help him out as I just got out of the water and said, look, you know, you might want to take those out. You're going to get zapped. Uh, he wasn't very receptive to the advice he knew everything uh, i was quite rude so I, I let him calm down and then after he dressed in and i was about to lock the helmet in i said oh what i did find was because we were cutting this structure is if you if you put your feet on the earth clamp and lay on the structure and cut at the other end uh, it's really comfortable knowing he was going to get electrocuted and uh he was oh yeah thanks sir thanks what i didn't know was he had a lot of other piercings in other places we started to get a lot of screaming and then this diver came out climbed up the ladder ripped the helmet off and we had to get him out of the suit and his pants were steaming and uh he'd fused his little chat to one of his other little friends in his pants and uh had cauterized it so we had to get the side cutters and uh snip those piercings for him but uh, he's okay he's all right I don't think there's anything to even add um, in that one. That's just, yeah, I think any man listening to that, that has brought tears to the <laughs> <laughs> Important safety tip. Make sure that you remove any piercings before you get into commercial diving. <laughs> I like it. Go on, Tech. How are you going to even, like, remotely go near that one? I can't. I'm about to pass out. I mean, just... <laughs> Oh my gosh. That's amazing. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> well, uh, I, I have to start off with a disclaimer. Uh, the disclaimer is this is for um, entertainment purposes only. This is not for instructional purposes and you should not do this nor emulate this in any way, shape or form. But back in the day, we prided ourselves on putting together really, really robust uh, instructor training courses. And so, uh, this, this was at university of Florida and we are, <laughs> we're at a sinkhole and, uh, this sinkhole at Manatee Springs, it, 
it's um, a side of a, a very strong magnitude flow spring. And that's where the cave is. So the cave picture, picture a uh, sink, just a sink in your, in your, uh, in your bathroom. And you've got the drain at the bottom. And then you've got that little thing, that overflow drain that's up at the, up at the top of the sink, right? That's kind of what this, this sink hole looked like. And um, so the cave is at the bottom and you could go into the cave and then the flow takes you way over to another spring. But there is this ledge that has a hole and the hole is what we call the chimney. And the chimney has a, a little tunnel that goes down to the same cave. So as I said, we really loved doing things as, as bold as we could and really putting instructor candidates through the paces. So my buddy Bennett and I get together and we're supposed to do a buddy breathing exercise. And our instructor candidate is Christy and Christy gets us to settle down on the ledge at the chimney. Well, we knew what was going to go on because the deal is, is that when you've got that, that ledge, it's, and that chimney, it's a siphon. So there is water flowing through it and it's sucking in. So sure enough, both Bennett and I sit with our fins straight up and out. So she can't get us. We weren't, we weren't kneeling and we're next to each other. And she tells us to get together and buddy breathe. So with that, I had rigged my, my, um, oh, it was a, it was an airshare. That's what it was. It was an airshare. Sorry. So I rigged my, um, octopus so that the keeper came off with it. So if you ever remember or see an octopus keeper, they, they used to be really long and they fit in the mouthpiece and it had the stem. So I get next to Bennett and I shove this thing in his mouth. And now he is like choking on it, but he's laughing and I'm laughing <laughs> and we're both doing this thing. And now I'm watching his mask flood and he's watching my mask flood and we are laughing uncontrollably and he can't get air. So he's pushing the purge and everything like that. And Chrissy, Christy cannot get to us because our fins are up and out, you know, like bad, bad. We did a bad technique and she didn't correct us for it. So that worked. So she couldn't get it and she couldn't help us. But at the same time, what were we feeling? As soon as we came together, we created so much surface area that we felt the rush of the water around our bodies, sucking, sucking, sucking. And then all of a sudden we just went, shoo, and we were gone. <laughs> and so, we both tumble and we're still doing this exercise, but it's not working and no one's getting air. And we just go back into this. And the last thing Chrissy sees is our fins. And of course, we made a dramatic exit. So we start flailing and we start doing all this as we go back. And that's it. Now, look, so Bennett and I were both cave divers, although we weren't um, equipped for cave Uh we knew the system. We knew it wasn't going to be dangerous. We knew where to go and how to get out of it. But Chrissy didn't. She thought we died. So she, all we saw was from the bottom of the chimney, we just saw this, the, the, the hole and her with a flashlight. And it was just shaking like, yeah, it was so sad. And then we came up <laughs> around, we came, we came out of the, out of the, the <laughs> cave and she's still looking and freaking out, we come around, and as soon as we wave to her, we sh we surprised her. We just came back behind her. As soon as we waved to her, she just flicked us off, both of us, and just bolted to the surface, crying. It was horrible. She almost dropped out of the out of the thing. So, as I say, don't do this. Don't think that it's any any professional thing, but I get tears in my eyes just reliving that story. <laughs> and uh, here's uh, funny, good stuff. She did become an instructor, which is great. And Bennett and Christy got married. Oh, there you go. <laughs> you Happy <see>. ending. Nice. <laughs> like, this is an important tip for anyone thinking if they're ever going to end up doing an instructor course is just keep an eye out for you doing something like that. 
you know, they yes. throw it in as a bit of a scenario now. <laughs> yeah, I won't be doing that one uh, anytime soon. That's for darn sure. But uh, oh yeah, we we did uh, we did lots of stunts. We did our own stunts. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like it. Oh, I think that's great. Well, I think we actually managed to answer most of the uh, questions that people <laughs> might have had with that. We were quite comprehensive with the questions about how people get into uh, into commercial diving or getting into instructor trainings. That was fantastic. And then there was two hilarious stories to end on. One brought tears to my eyes for a different reason. So the last <laughs> one was great. <laughs> great so it just leaves me to say thank you very much for joining us this afternoon, guys. Um, it was uh, very illuminating. Um, and thank you very much. Safe Thank time. you very much. Thanks, Mark. So that was great. Tech and Sal hopefully answered all your questions, but feel free to fire some comments on there. We can always pass them on to the guys. Um, really, just last thing to say is big thank you to Meflex Hoses, our sponsors. Uh, again, like we said, their shop's open now, even through lockdown. Uh, so if you need some new hoses for your regs, get onto them, check them out. Some nice coloured ones there. Add a bit of a brightness to your day. Um, really, that's it. We've, uh, we've rounded up today. We'll be back again next week, uh, Tuesday the 9th of June. We'll be back at 8 p.m. BST. Um, we're going to be talking about a cave diving expedition to a remote part of Indonesia. Uh, so we're going to have Rasmus Dystead, Maria Bollerup, and Pete Mesley all the way from New Zealand. Uh, he'll be joining us. Um, they've got some stunning imagery as well from that one. So, uh, so join us for that. And look forward to seeing you. In the meantime, if you manage to get out, safe diving. <laughs>